Good afternoon, everyone. Ooh, this is loud. How's everyone? Great to see you all. Is this too loud or is it all right? That's good. <clears throat> How's everyone feeling? Yep. Fighting, struggle. You know, it's Monday. You can't. You... That's always uh... Uh, <clears throat> so. So before we get started, I would like to formally apologize for the setup this evening. Um, the events team is on vacation after the uh, EHL conference they had, a lot of running around that week. So they informed me ahead of time that they wouldn't be able to set up for our Through the Word class this evening. That's the reason for having only uh, three tables. And actually, the three tables were set up by a wonderful crew of Christians here who came in a little earlier and uh, did that. <laughs> So, so just again, um, you know, make yourselves comfortable. If you would like to, there are tables, there's more tables in the back. If you want to roll them out, if you just want to sit wherever you want to sit, there's room on the tables. Make yourselves comfortable. Move around. Um, tonight for our opening word, and you can begin to turn there with me, we're going we're gonna to look at the book of Romans, chapter 12, at uh, some very familiar verses. The first two verses of chapter 12 in the book of Romans for our opening word. And then we will be segueing into the Apocalypsis, the book of Revelation, where we have left off in chapter 12. And last time we met, we spoke on spiritual warfare. So, for our opening word, we are in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I'll give you a moment to turn there. I see some of you are still turning there. This is the word of the Lord to you and I this evening, this afternoon. Verse 1, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The word of the Lord. I would like to give all of you about one minute or so, maybe a minute and a half, just to meditate on those two verses, spend a moment just to reread that, and then we'll pick it up from there. Here in the book of Romans, Paul the Apostle, who in many ways is like a father <clears throat> to the believers in the first century church, offers 
eminently practical advice. Eminent or eminently practical advice. Advice that does not leave aside one aspect of our being, but in a single word, captures the fullness of who we are as homo sapiens, as human beings. In this single word that captures the fullness of us, we see it distilled in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 12 in the book of Romans. Rather than defaulting to a kind of Greco-Roman mentality that would have the human being be bifurcated or split along the sides of body and soul dynamics, he addresses them both. Paul the Apostle speaks to the Christians in Rome regarding not only their minds slash soul, but also their bodies. And amazingly, through the advent of Christ's incarnation, he does so by first starting with the bodies. He says, offer your body as a living sacrifice unto God. And he says this in light of the mercy of God, as we see here in the opening verse of chapter 12. He says, in view of God's mercy. And if you're taking notes or you are uh, inclined to uh, underline in your Bible, I would just encourage you to, to, to underline or highlight that phrase, mercy. God's mercy. Again, mercy is, mercy is not receiving what we ought to receive. In the great gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we see the beautiful enfolding mercy of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That rather than coming to us with a heavy hand for judgment, he comes to us with a warm embrace. Amen? Rather than wheeling ferocious judgment onto us in light of our own sins, God in himself, by way of his servant and son, Jesus Christ, takes upon himself the wrath due unto us. That is mercy. Amen? Not only is it mercy, it is grace. And he says, in light of that mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. One of the uh, words I believe the Lord is speaking to us this evening out of this passage is the following. You don't merely have a body, you are your body. You don't just have a body, you are your body. Just as you are your soul and your spirit. And the reason why we know this is twofold. Number one, the great doctrine of the resurrection. The goal is not disembodiment, where we spend eternity with God away from our bodies. That's not the goal. That is not the gospel. That's not Christianity. That's not what Jesus taught. The goal is actually resurrection from the dead. Amen? Where our bodies will be transformed onto like his body where our bodies will be spiritualized, something amazing will happen, where our physicality will be transmuted into a higher plane of existence. Nevertheless, we are our bodies as, far as, as much as we are our souls. It is true that when we die, to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. But that is an interim time. Heaven is not the goal, sisters and brothers. Heaven on earth is the goal. Heaven or disembodiment is not the goal. Heaven on earth, where heaven and earth kiss for all eternity in the new Jerusalem, as we see in, verse, in chapters 22 and 23 of the book of Revelation. Amen? And so in light of that, 
great doctrine of the resurrection, we can also add to that the doctrine and teaching of the enfleshment of our Lord Jesus Christ. You remember the opening of Gospel of John? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you go a few more verses down to verse 13, verse 14. You see it says, and the Word, that word Word is logos in Greek, the Word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. Christ's resurrection is not spirit disembodiment. That would not be the resurrection. In fact, when you read the resurrection accounts, which I hope we all may be doing during this resurrection season that we are in, Easter season, we see that Jesus takes great pains to communicate the fact that he is not a disembodied spirit, but that he is indeed flesh and blood. Yes, resurrected, but flesh and blood indeed. So what then is the spiritual lesson for you and I? What is one of the things that God is communicating to us out of this passage? Number one, again, you don't merely have a body, you are your body. And because your body is very much caught up in your identity, it matters very much to God what we do with our bodies. What we do with our bodies matters very much to our Lord. Our bodies are not our own, along with our souls. They are not our own. The scriptures say we have been bought with what? A price. And not just any price, an infinite price. It cost God everything to redeem us from the curse of death, hell, and the grave. Amen? And so we are called, as followers of Jesus, as Christians, to offer our bodies, sisters and brothers, to God as a living sacrifice. We ought to be mindful of what we do with our hands and with our feet, with the totality of our enfleshment. We ought to live in such a way that our bodies are directed to the glory of God, that our bodies are directed to the glory of God. What we do with our bodies matters much. Amen? Amen? Amen. I want to also say this with regards to our bodies. Consider communication. Uh, Communication experts say that um, uh, most language is actually nonverbal. And we communicate roughly 80 to 85% non-verbally. I want us to sit with that statistic for a second. That 85% of our speech, if you will, is non-verbal. That's almost hard to believe, especially in the sea of words we find ourselves in. But communication experts say that we communicate most definitively through our body, our nonverbal cues. Our nonverbal cues. That's something that we should, as Christians, pay attention to. Because if we are to be followers of Jesus, amen, we are then called to love God with all of ourselves and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, correct? Correct? The question is, how are we loving each other? I would submit to you that we're probably not loving each other too well if we are just concerned about words spoken and not concerned about actions, not concerned about body posture, the nonverbal cues. Let me, let me give you an illustration of how uh, this looks. Notice the phonetic. Notice the language that I will use. I love you. I love you. Notice how I, in both, both instances, I use the exact same words, right? But radical meaning was communicated very differently. How so? By way of our nonverbal cues. You saw that? So as believers, we ought to be mindful of how we posture ourselves. Think of it like this. Are we smiling one to another? 
Are we embracing one another? Do we have a body that is oriented towards the service of others? Are we caring for one another? How am I communicating to you the love of God? How am I communicating the love of God to the world? So that you may say with our words, God loves you. But if you're not communicating that with your body, your words are made null and void. Amen? Amen? So we ought to be mindful of how we communicate via our bodies. That's the first verse we see here in chapter 12. Offer your bodies as living, living sacrifices. You know, in, before I move on past verse 1, I want to say, do you remember King David in the Old Testament? This man, this man is given the unbelievable title as a man after God's own what? Heart. This guy knew how to worship. He knew how to praise. He knew how to live for the heart of God. He was not par- perfect, far from it. But when the, when the, when the um, Ark of the Covenant was recaptured, David started dancing. And he did so in an unseemly fashion for a king, for a man of royalty. This guy was leading the parade, dancing, doing backflips, breakdancing. Who knows what David was doing? To the degree in which one of his ladies was like, Yo, David, you know, you're looking like a fool. And David had to rebuke her. He said, this is, this is for God. We all, we all should be doing this. So not only are we called to love one another with our bodies well, listen carefully, we are also called to love God with our bodies well. Amen? So when I'm worshiping the Lord, right, and I sense the Spirit of God, I sense the Spirit of God saying to me, loosen up a little bit. The question I have to have for myself is this, am I loosening up? If the Holy Spirit is encouraging me by subtle promptings, you know, Joe, it's okay, you can raise your hand up like this. If, if I sense the Holy Spirit calling me to do that during, let's say, a time of worship, the question I ought to have for myself is, am I being obedient? Because the Lord doesn't just want worship due unto his name with our lips alone, but with our lifestyles and even our bodies. Amen? Amen. We should be mindful of that. That doesn't mean that everybody who's jumping and praising and, and, and doing that automatically de facto loves God. It's much deeper than that. But it does say something about the person's spirit and heart. For our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, especially when it's done from an authentic place. Amen? Amen? Amen. So the body ought to be mindful. We should be very mindful of our bodies. Let me just say this also. The second verse in chapter 12, book of Romans. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And then he gives a conditional clause, a conditional clause. He he says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's an amazing promise in the Bible. That is an amazing conditional clause. Because it's an if-then statement. It's a then statement. He's saying this, if you renew your mind, then you will be able to discern the will of God. But if I'm not in a place where my mind is being renewed, how then, I can I, how then can I hear the voice of the Holy Spirit concerning my own life? I may be trying to discern a decision. This scripture here teaches me that I should be in a place where my mind is, in fact, being renewed so that I can hear from the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. What are some practical ways that I found myself... Um, Um, being able to more and more renew my mind before God? Very simple. For me, it's been Scripture. It's been spending time in the Bible. Spending time in the Holy Bible. It's in the Bible 
it's in the Bible that we ourselves are read. We don't read the scriptures, it reads us. When our heart comes to scriptures with the right, authentic posture, we find that we are disarmed before the word of God. We don't come with our tools to examine and study the word as if the word is open to mere human manipulation. No, when we come with an open, posturing heart, the word reads us. The word studies us. Amen? The best kind of preaching is preaching that simply reads the Bible. A preaching that is rooted in the word of God. A teaching that is rooted in the word of God. Not the words of man, not the words of humanity, but fundamentally the words of God. And so I have found my mind being able to be renewed when I spend time in Holy Scripture. I would also say for me, one of the great spiritual disciplines that have helped me, actually even in the past week or so, I've been finding breakthrough in my own life and in my own discipleship through journaling. I, 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 I need to journal. And I praise the Lord for the spiritual discipline of journaling. Especially when I go back into my journals and look what I wrote years past. Prayers that I've prayed. Questions that I wrestled with. Tears soaked in the journal. And seeing how God has brought me through. There are so many prayers that our Lord has answered and we haven't given him the praise. So many things that we've come to the Lord for and he's come through. But we didn't, we didn't acknowledge him. Many of us are like the nine leopards that were healed rather than the one that came back and gave thanks to Jesus. And so, so journaling is a beautiful thing because it helps us to keep a track record of God's faithfulness. And when I go back into my journaling and when I practice journaling, I find my mind being renewed. I begin to see patterns not only of God's working in my lives, but I even, I even begin to see patterns of my own flesh, my own brokenness, my sinful nature that needs to be dealt with, that needs to be uprooted, that needs to be spoken to in the power of the gospel. Amen? But I've only, for me personally, I've only been able to do that really um, uh, uh, efficaciously through journaling. So journaling, spending time in the word of God. I will also say this. Um, with regards to renewing our minds. It's quite simple. John puts it so eloquently, so simply. I think it's in chapter 2 of 1 John. Don't love the things of the world. If you love the things of the world, if you love the world, in this sense the word world or cosmos in Greek means the worldly system. The worldly system, not people in the world. right? The worldly system. The Bible says if we find ourselves having a love affair with the world, with the worldly system, the, the love of the Father is not in us. There's something lacking of the, the visceral love of the Father in our hearts when we find ourselves loving the world. And if you ever want to know what that love looks like, John tells us plainly. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I encourage you to do a study on those uh, three phrases. Go deep into the word. Find out what does that actually mean. What does it mean for you? Where in your life do you struggle with that? And begin to, by way of the cultivation of the virtues established by the Holy Spirit, begin to uproot those um, twisted love affairs with the things of this world. Amen? God loves you. Remember that. The Father loves you with an undying love. Our discipleship, our ability to follow Jesus every day is rooted not in our ability to follow him, but in his love for us, which kickstarts us in the ability to follow him. Amen? His grace is sufficient. With that said, I would like to open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll segue into Revelation for our study this evening.
And so, Father, we thank you for this holy reminder of your love for us. We thank you, Father, that you do not see us as a divided person, but as a whole human being, body, soul, and spirit. You teach us, Father, to be mindful and to handle with care our bodies as well as our minds and our hearts. You teach us, Father, through your holy word that our bodies matter to you. And what we do with our bodies, how we dress, how we communicate one to another, how we posture before each other matters to you. We ask you, Father, that you would continue to open our eyes in this area, that we may continue to grow in holiness and in sanctification. Father, we also ask you, Lord, to help us renew our minds daily, spend time in the Word, to spend time communing with you, Father. And so we invite you into our minds and in our hearts and into our bodies, Holy Spirit, because we know, Lord, you have made us temples. You, unbelievably so, dwell within our hearts. And so we give you praise and thanksgiving for this. We ask that you would open your word uh, to us within the book of Revelation, chapter 12 and 13. Allow us to celebrate and rejoice your goodness, even during times of shifting and change that some of us are going through this evening. I ask that you would, Father, speak a solid word to us in such a way that we leave differently than we came in this, this evening. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen, amen. Turn with me to the book of Revelation where we are. Chapter 12. And last we met, we had an, a, a wonderful time talking about uh, spiritual warfare. Revelation chapter 12. Hmm. We there? Yeah. So last time, um, we, we, we read chapter 12, and the Spirit showed up. Amen? Um, reminding us of the importance of standing firm in the gospel truth. Standing firm in the grace of God in doing battle against the wicked one. And so what I want to do is recap some of the uh, um, teachings that, wa that was communicated last time we met and then move forward and press into chapter 13. So you guys ready? Let's, let's just read just the first couple of verses of chapter 12 here. Again, it says, Great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. And she was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Let's stop there before we go into verse 3. And we, we began to think through of the imagery portrayed here. And I said to us that that woman here signifies both Israel and the church. She signifies Israel and the church. In fact, that image shifts uh, as the prophetic images continue to be filled in in both chapter 12 and in chapter 13. It starts off as um, this woman being the personification of Israel. The personification of Israel. The 12 uh, stars and the crown represent the 12 tribes of Israel. The sun, the moon, the whole nine signify Israel's ruling class, their, their, their kingship, their priesthood, uh, their holiness. Other theologians and, and biblical commentaries would, would say, well, this also images Mary, the mother of God, the mother of Jesus Christ. In as far as Christ, as full man and full divinity, was present in her womb by way of the conception rendered unto her through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. 
so that Mary is also a personification of Israel. She is the Israelite that actually says yes to the word of God through the angel Gabriel. When she says, I am yours. She says, how will this happen? Gabriel responds with regards to the power of the Holy Spirit overshadowing her. And she says, all right. Her faithful, her faithful response to the Lord is an unbelievable teaching for you and I. When the, when the word of God comes to you, when the word of God comes to me, are we like Mary? Are we like Miriam? That's how you would say her name in Hebrew. Do we say, yes, Lord? Or do we fight? Ah, I know the Lord is calling me. Do you remember this past Sunday? For those of you who are here, it was an unbelievable word preached by uh, Rich on, on Jesus saying, uh, you know, to Peter, don't, don't worry about John. <laughs> Follow me. That he's going to take you to a place where you're not going to be necessarily comfortable with. And, and, and Mary was taken to that place. Her job was not easy. I mean, here she was betrothed. She had to communicate this news to Joe. Joseph was like, I'm not about this life. This woman definitely cheated on me. We're not even married. He wanted to secretly put her away. God had to reveal an angel to him in the dream. So, you know, the whole shame, the whole... And the whole thing, just the suffering that she had to endure, watching her son on the cross, and uh, unbelievable. And so Israel is not only personified here, but also Mary as the personification of Israel. Very powerful, very beautiful. In verse 3, we read, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns, on its head. Now here the dragon is none other than the great deceiver, the ancient serpent, the devil. Okay? Notice as we said uh, the the image articulated here. It's an enormous red dragon, not small, enormous in size, speaking of its breadth and its capacity to overshadow the world. We see that this dragon is red and has seven heads. The seven heads, the word, the, the number seven we know, signifies completion, biblically speaking. And seven heads speak of its intelligentsia, the intelligence of Satan. Satan is sophisticatedly cunning. You know how we say the two heads are better than one? This, this, this ancient serpent has seven heads. And as if that weren't enough, it has ten horns. The horn signifies power. The horn signifies power. So power, 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 ten times. And seven crowns on its head, signifying Satan as the ruler of this age. The king of kings in the fallen sense, not in the sense of Christ. Amen? In the fallen sense. Do you remember when um, the devil was tempting Jesus in the wilderness? Do you remember that? One of the temptations was, hey, I got you then. Hey, uh, you know, you, you worship me. I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. Well, that presupposes that he actually has the power to give him the kingdoms of this world. Right? Right? This guy has access. The devil has not only strategic awareness and intelligence, not only does he have power, illustrated here in the Ten Horns, but he also has lordship. The Bible says he is the God of this age, the God of this fallen world, the fallen worldly system. That's something to be, to be mindful of, because sometimes as believers, we, we get a little haughty. We can get a little silly, thinking that because Jesus won the victory, I can just simply chill and sit back. And the Bible says, mm -mm, he has indeed won the victory, but you are to walk out in that victory. You are to renew your mind. 
you are to remember who is indeed king of kings and lord of lords. And if we're not renewing our mind, if we're not being mindful of our bodies, we will easily be co-opted to the stratagem of Satan. Amen? So, right, we started speaking about this in light of spiritual warfare. Dan, what's up, bro? Go ahead. Right. You could read that into the scripture, but that would be more of an eisegesis. And the reason is because the seven deadly sins is something constructed in late medieval period or right before the medieval period in the, by church theologians and thinkers. So that the phrase seven deadly sins is not present in New Testament narrative in that sense, but an extrapolation of the sins. Right, right. Continuing here, past verse 3, we see here in verse 4, its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The third of the stars out of the sky signified the third of the angelic host. The third of the angelic host. A third of the angels fallen and deceived by the tail of Satan. And their deception ends in their fall from glory to the earth. Mm. Think of the dragon. Think of the, the mythological dragon. The dragon's power is in its fire breathing and its tail that whips. That can take down cedar trees. Right? Right? So the tail here signifies, it could signify in many ways, the, the, the outworking of the satanic strategy. Okay? The tail is an image of deception because if you ever notice, if you ever try to, right, you try to follow a tail, it's hard, right? It's like, shh, shh, shh. You, gotta, you have to look at the body, not the tail. If you get caught up on the tail, you'll fall into a hypnotic gaze. It's like, what? What happened? Right? Let, let me give you an illustration. Let me give you an illustration. In boxing, they, they teach you when you do martial arts or boxing, when you're fighting, when you're coming against an opponent, they say, don't look at the hands. If you, if you try to look at the hands, you're going to get clocked. You can't look at the hands. It's like looking at the tail. How then do you in, anticipate where the hit is going to come? You don't look at the tail or the hands. Where do you look? The shoulders. The shoulders, the body, the posturing of the body. Because the shoulders tell you where the move is coming from. So in that sense here, analogously to the tail, if we focus only on the tail, if we focus only on the weapon, we will get hit. We have to focus on the, the, the weapon wielder. That is the dragon himself, the heart of the dragon. Okay? Um, it goes on, the dragon stood in front of the woman. Uh, who was about to give birth, so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. Do you remember the uh, narrative in the Gospels when King Herod heard and right killed all the innocents in Bethlehem and tried to take them out, and that's it. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Why do you think Satan is mad? This child is to rule and to rule with an iron scepter. This is the promised one, the anointed one, the Mashiach ben David, the Messiah son of David, the Mashiach ben Yosef, the Messiah son of Joseph, who in both his royalty and in his rejection by his brethren, Mashiach ben Yosef, or Messiah the son of Joseph, he will overtake and destroy the works of Satan. Jesus says, I have come to destroy the works of Satan. The devil simply comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come to give you what? Life and life more abundantly. The dragon is waiting. She gave birth to a son, a male child. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Continuing here, the woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. 
There are many commentators as to what the days here signify. Does that signify the tribulation dynamism that will happen with regards to the church in the end times? Does it signify Israel being in exile until they're brought home? There are different interpretations. The key here is not so much to get caught up on the numbers themselves, but how God providentially protects his own. Not only does he protect the son, he protects the woman. He protects the church. He protects Israel. Amen? Amen. The Lord even protects Mary. Do you remember when Jesus is on the cross? And he says, woman, behold your son. To John, John, behold your mother. God is all about protecting his own. When you pay your allegiance to the Lord, when you say yes to God, he sees that. He sees it, and he honors it. He knows this walk is not easy. But we we have to remember that he has our backs, amen? Not only does he have our backs, he has our fronts, he has our sides, he's above us, he's below us, he's all around us, he keeps us. He is the rock by which we cannot stumble. He is the tree by which we are rooted deep down. He is the one who feeds us manna, the one who gives us sustenance. This is the Lord. Who protects. Verse 7, then war broke out in heaven. Michael, oh man, we had a good time talking about Michael. What does his nine name signify? Mm, who is like unto God? That's a nice name, Michael, right? Michael, Michael, who is like unto God? The, the archangel, the one who goes toe-to-toe with Satan. Ooh, the fight of the cosmos. And it's amazing here because his name says something. It teaches you and I something about spiritual warfare that we've looked at. Notice how Michael doesn't come against Satan in his own strength. His very name is what? Who is like unto God. His strength emanates from his recognition of who the Lord is. When you go toe-to-toe with the enemy, it's not you. It's the Lord. Amen? I mean, I can't stress that enough. It's not you. We are to be like Michael in this sense. When the enemy tries to come and deceive you and trick you and use his tail to confuse you and your thoughts are cloudy and your mind is in fog and your soul feels wretched and your heart is turning and your body is weak, you stand up in the name of Jesus Christ and you say, who is like unto God? You could take me out, don't matter, God. You're not God. Amen? Amen. Who is like unto God? Who is like unto God? That's Michael. That's Michael. That's his name. Who is like unto God? And so he goes toe-to-toe here. So Michael and his angels, he comes with the posse. Boom. Fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angel. He came with his crew. Boom. What? (laughs) Verse 8. But he was not strong enough. I want you to underline that. I want you to highlight that. I want you to remember that. I want you to meditate on that. I want you to celebrate it. I want you to worship the Lord for that, for that verse. I forgot. What did I say? <laughs> but he was not strong enough. But he was not strong enough. He was not strong enough. He was not strong enough. Was not strong enough. All power has been given unto me, Jesus says, in heaven and on earth. Go and make disciples of nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The great commission to the apostles and to the church worldwide, the great commission is rooted in the recognition of who actually has the lordship and the power. It is Jesus. Jesus says, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go. Don't worry about it. Go. Tread on serpents and scorpions. Heal. Lay hands. Deliver. Don't get caught up in fear. Fear is not of God. Grow. Push. Persevere. Speak the word of God. Baptize. Amen? Amen. Verse 9. The great dragon was, of course, hurled down where he belongs. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the deceiver, who leads the whole world astray. 
Satan's power over the world is nothing more than a lie. Satan's power over the world is nothing more than a lie. People are deceived because they believe in a lie. We get deceived. We get tripped up and caught up because we end up believing in a lie. Amen? But First John, we read by the Apostle's pen, your faith has overcome the world. You are already victorious. You are already victorious. You can't be defeated. You have already overcome the world, the worldly system, the liar and his works of lies. You have already overcome witchcraft. You have already overcome demonic deception. You have already overcome the speech of the media. You have already overcome the political, economic, and social system that seeks to continue to oppress the poor, marginalized, and disenfranchised. You have already overcome. Overcome how? In Christ. And so as I said before, I say it again, we do not fight for victory. We fight from the place of victory. We are already victorious, which is why Paul writes in chapter 8 of the book of Romans, who could ever separate you from the love of God? Can perseverance, I mean, can, can persecution, famine, the sword, nakedness, the devil, the powers of hell, nothing can ever separate you from the love of God. You are more than conquerors in Christ. You are more than conquerors in Christ. Our ability to experience the joy and the peace of the Lord is directly proportional to our ability to believe that word. If we find ourselves with lack of joy, if we find ourselves weighed down and burdened with all kinds of thoughts that are from the enemy, it's because we are choosing to believe a lie than the truth. That doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean that we won't experience hardships and difficulties. We will. And the enemy comes in times and in seasons. He will look for opportune times. That's how the enemy works. Remember the Bible when after uh, Satan uh, attempts to tempt Jesus? The Bible says, and I think it's in the Gospel of Luke, he left for an opportune time. He said, I'll come back to you later, Jesus. I'll come back to you later. When did, when did the devil attack Jesus? When Jesus was, was fasting, didn't, your brother didn't eat for 40 days, at his weakest moment when his flesh was walling out. When did the enemy attack? When Jesus could have slapped the enemy by sending legions of angels in the time of the Garden of Gethsemane. When he acquiesces, Jesus acquiesces to the will of the Father. He could have stood up and flexed over Satan, but Satan, but he didn't. He knew his call. He knew the path. He knew he had to bear the cross for you and for me. And so what does, what does, the Satan, what does Satan do? He'll, he'll mock. He'll jeer. He'll even say through the Pharisees and through the Sadducees and through the priests while Jesus is on the cross. Come on, bro. You healed so many people. Come down. If you're the Messiah, come down from the cross. Come down from the cross. Imagine that. Mock trial. Under Jewish law, they are not to try anyone at night. That's precisely when they've tried Jesus. They spit on him. False witnesses. Mouth is silent. Mouth is silent. Paul says, know who your enemy is. Your enemy is not flesh and blood. You got beef with somebody, you already got confused. You're, you're already, you're already, you're, your eye is already off. They are not the enemy. It's much deeper than that. Always much deeper than that. Amen? Amen. Sister Monique, you had your hand up. First Peter, yes. So 
Amen. Amen. Let me uh, find, where's that scripture? I think that's in 1 Peter. Where are my Bible scholars? 1 Peter, I think it's in chapter 5. I think it's in chapter 5. Yeah, 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 chapter 5. Uh, let me just read it from verse 5 onward. Chapter 5, verse 5. You don't have to turn there with me. First Peter, chapter 5, verse 5. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because, quote, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. That they may lift, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Here it is now. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the what? In the faith. Which faith? The faith. The faith that has overcome the world. Because you know that the, um, that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings as you are. That's, a, that's already implicitly instructive for you and I. Why would, why would Peter here write, why would Peter here write, um, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings as you. You know why? Because Peter knows one of the strategies that Satan uses against us. Please pay attention. It's very important. One of the strategies that the enemy uses against us is to get you to believe that you're going through this alone. That no one can understand your suffering or pain. That you're going through this alone. It's a lie. It's a lie. Which is why we need each other. Which is why we ought to confess our struggles one to another. Which is why we are to seek community and live in community and be with one another. Amen? Amen. Love covers a multitude of sins. But we cannot receive love, neither can we give love if we are isolated, alone, in our own private cell, in our mind. And so back to chapter 12. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Verse 10, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now now, now this is it, this is beautiful. A loud voice in heaven. Here we go. Worship, worship, worship. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been what? Hurled down. Defeated. Defeated. They triumphed over him. How? By the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony. By the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony. How do, how do you overcome the devil? Not by works righteousness. Not by trying to be good. Not by works. That's not how you overcome the devil. You overcome the enemy by the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the remission of sins. He is the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. When we plead the blood of Jesus, when we sing about the blood of Jesus, when we confess the holy flow, Divine blood on the wooden cross, we proclaim victory. For Jesus is the fulfillment of all the entire sacrificial system set up in the Old Testament. I'll say that again. Jesus is the fulfillment 
of the entire sacrificial system set up in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. The pigeons, the doves, the bulls, the lambs, Passover, the whole nine. Jesus fulfills every jot and tittle, every crossing of the I, of the, of the T, and the dotting of every I of the Old Testament. Jesus is all in all. He fulfills all of it. And through his sacrifice, we can stand victorious. We plead the blood of Jesus. Why? Because it's through his blood we are cleansed. We are saints of God. We are holy because of his blood that covers us. Amen? So when you are covered by the blood of Christ, when you sing about the blood, when you plead the blood of Jesus, what you are saying is, I'm cleansed. I'm cleansed. What accusation can Satan hurl against me? What authority does Satan have over me if I'm cleansed? You know the reason why in our flesh we have no authority over Satan? Because it's in our flesh we are living out the pattern that happened with Adam and Eve when they first sinned and gave over the keys of authority to the enemy. When Jesus came back and established the kingdom, you know what he did? He took back what was already ours that we gave over in forfeiting it by way of sin. That's why we had to leave the Garden of Eden. That's why all of a sudden the earth turned against us and everything is against us. Because in our brokenness, in our flesh, we, have, we give the authority over to Satan. And this happens not only from a cosmic perspective, but even particularly in our individual lives. When I'm living in habitual sin, besetting sin, what I'm literally doing is I'm giving the keys of authorities back to Satan. Go ahead, go ahead. You can be a squatter in my house again. You can take up residence in my heart against Satan. You can set up your, your roots of bitterness. You can establish your kingdom of darkness again in, in this area of my life and in that area of my life and in that area of my life. And Satan, you know what? You can go and have that area of my thought life as well because I have sinned and now I'm giving this over to you by virtue of my sin. This is why we are to live holy lives so we can have authority. How do we live it? Plead the blood. How do we live it? Confess Christ is Savior. He is Lord. He is King. Remember the cross. Remember the cross. Remember the cross. Be cruciformed onto Christ. And it's in that, it's in that we have authority. That's why the devils tremble when a Christian prays. That's why the demonic trembles when the Christian knows his place in Christ. When the sister, when the beloved daughter of the father knows her place on the throne room of God, the demonic tremble. Why? Because this believer, this Christian knows that they are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. It has nothing to do with them. So the enemy knows this, right? The enemy knows this. And so what he does is he comes at us with the seven heads and the, and the ten horns and the seven crowns, right? He comes all kinds of sideways. Boom, boom, right? He'll get you to fall into little patterns of sin. Boom, now you're in this little cycle of sin, right? Then he's going to be whispering into your mind, look at you, oh, bro, you shouldn't, come on. You can't be doing that. You a Christian, really? You about that life? Right? Get lying to you, lying to you, getting, to, getting you and I to believe in the lie. Now, once we start believing the lie, what, what happens? We sin, and then we fester in our sin. I'm not even going to go to confess. Not yet. I'm, I may do it tomorrow. Let me just self-wallow. Let me beat myself a little bit. Let me, let me experience my distance from the Father. I'm going to not repent yet. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to weep. And then maybe like stay on my knees for 12 hours. Listen, that's exactly what the enemy wants. Because guess what? He gets you and I to fall into the logic of thinking, oh, well, if I do this to myself and my body, then I'll win, my, I'll win approval back onto God. So if you look at documentaries and you study the medieval church, you study the ancient church, and you see why certain people got a little crazy and self-flagellation and they sin and they start beating themselves and whatnot, it's the same logic. 
It's the same liturgy of repentance that you and I tend to go through. It's just maybe a little bit more extreme in certain areas. We don't overcome Satan by self-punishing, but by pleading the blood. By pleading the blood of Jesus. It's the blood. It's the cross. Amen? It's the cross. And the triumph over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. I mean, we could just stop right there for the rest of the evening. I mean, that's, I mean, I would like to go further. We will. But check that out. The word of their testimony. Why is it that we go through great lengths in new life to capture people's testimony via, the video, uh, via videos? Like, what's up with that? Why can't we just dunk people in the waters? Like, bro, let's just get baptized. Boom. Like, what's up with this confession of, of testimonies? It says something. When we remember our testimony, go ahead. It's it. Yes. Amen. That's right. One of the most powerful, powerful evangelistic tools we have at our disposal is our own story. Our own story. How God has set us free. That is our testimony. That is, how, that is our testimony. That's our testimony. That's right. That's right. You got it. That's it. Testimony is key to overcoming the wicked one. So, okay, what does that mean in like, you know, every day, right? As I said, the enemy will attempt, as he always does, to, to get us to forfeit gospel thinking for fleshly thinking, right? He'll say, all right, you know, comes with the lies. And when we do that, living out of a context of sin, we are actually living out of the place of for, for, forgetfulness. We have forgotten where God has taken us from. Our testimony reminds us of where we come from. Our testimony reminds us of the power of God to deliver. Our testimony also keeps us humble. Remembering that we weren't born Christians. And that sin is very real. And so our testimonies ought to teach us humility. Right? Humility. Holy reverence for the King of Kings and His power. Humility. The blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony overcome the world. Natasha. Mm -hmm. days ago, mm -hmm. and I said to my best friend, the way that I was able to work through it was by speaking truth to myself, reminding myself of what 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 God has delivered me from, and and for me, I couldn't just do it in my mind because there's something powerful about your speech and declaring it in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think this other versions have it by the yes. word of their testimony, yes. and because it's something not. Not that you can't do it in your head, but something about verbalizing it. It just gives power to what you're saying. Amen. It's, it's giving glory back to God that you're acknowledging it. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. But check it out. It, go, it goes on. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. <sighs> Persecution. Martyrdom. To be a martyr, the word martyr comes from the Greek word martus, which means witness, sign, or witness. They did not love their lives to the degree in which they sh said no to death. They said, you can kill me, I'm still going to praise my Lord. I'm not going to, what? I would like for you to, when you get a chance... Take down the following name. For those of you who are writing notes or whatever, take the following name. He has a weird name. You know, he's ancient. His name was Polycarp. P-O-L-Y-C-A-R-P. 
C-A-R-P, Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle. <laughs> Polycarp. You everyone got that down? When you go online, go on Google, type in Polycarp um, um, Martyrdom. Martyrdom. I forget the name of the book that records how he died. Jesus what? Oh, in that book? They, they have it there? Okay. That's a, that's a subsection? Yeah. This is, this is a whole book. And Polycarp also wrote some epistles. And it's very interesting because he is one degree removed from Jesus. He is the apostle of John. He was one of the, he was trained by John in Ephesus. Anyway, the reason why I'm bringing him up is because Polycarp, like many, many of our sisters and brothers in the faith that came before us, suffered, suffered martyrdom. He was brought into a gladiatorial arena. Uh, pretty much the emperor was like, yo, for, forfeit Jesus. Just forfeit Jesus. You're an old man. I think he was like 82 or 89, something like that. They're like, listen, bro, we're going to, you know, that's it. And he said, how can I go against Jesus, the one who's been good, for, good to me for over 80 years? And they, they, they're like, listen, all you got to do is offer a pinch of incense to, to Caesar, say that he is Lord, say that Caesar is Lord, you'd be good to go. You can go home, you can go back to your church and do whatever you want. He's like, nah. He's like, you might as well kill me now because that's not going to happen. I refuse. I refuse to releg on the commitment. I refuse to forfeit my baptismal vows. I know who I am. For me to say... For me to go against Christ is to go against who I am. I am a Christian before anything else. You got to read that. Read that testimony. Powerful stuff. Do we have faith? This is the question. <clears throat> Do we have faith to persevere to the end like that? Do we have faith to persevere to the end like that. Verse 12, Therefore rejoice, you, heaven, you heavens and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. Verse 13, When the, when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, that's already an amazing line. I mean, that's such a weird way of writing it, isn't it? Let me read that again. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth. You know what that presupposes? You know what that assumes, that, that, that part of the sentence? It, it's saying something about the dragon getting knocked out. Only people who get knocked out realize that they're on the floor. Like, what? how did I get on the floor? So the, the Bible says here, when the dragon saw that he was on the earth, that says something about the might of God. That says something about Michael, whose name is, who is like unto God. When the dragon saw, he came to his awareness. He's like, wait, what? How did I end up here? He pursued the woman. Who's the woman again? Mary. But who else? Right? That's, that's a personification of what? Israel and the church. Israel and the church. He pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, time, and a half time out of the serpent's reach. Again, that's, there are a lot of interpretations. Does this signify God protecting the church in some way during the great tribulation for three and a half years? Time, time, and a half a time signifies three and a half years. Some scholars will say seven and a half years. Is this something more metaphorical that speaks of something else? I just leave that up to you to go and do your research. There are many, many um, interpretations and debates about it. Where we should, excuse me, where she uh, would be cared for for a time, time, half a time, out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water, like a river, to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. 
Um, verse 16, I would like for you to just circle that or highlight verse 16. That's something to be said there. I'll come back to it in just a moment. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. Other believers. There's a lot going on here. What does that mean that the, the dragon spewed out water out of her mouth to drown the, the, the woman? The scholars, again, debate as to the significance of this. What is interesting, however, is how the earth stepped up and saved the woman. How the earth stepped up. Here's the reason why that's interesting. What sin has done, you know, sin, sin has done a lot. One of the ramifications of sin is having the earth turn against us. So let me bring you back to, let me bring you back to Genesis real quick. Adam, or as we pronounce it, Adam. Adam is a derivative from the Hebrew word Adama, which means land or earth. So the very name Adam means he who is from the earth. What you see in the Genesis narrative onward in scripture is once sin enters into the world, the human beings, Adam and Eve, are pushed further and further away from the land. The land becomes alien. Do you remember the curse that God pronounces over Adam about the weeds? And now you're going to be working with the sweaty. Things are not going to come easy now. All of these things are up. You know, now you have to leave the garden, which everything was already prepared for you. Now you got to go into the earth. And then, right, and, and then weird statements like with Cain and Abel and how the blood cries from the earth. Now we tend to read over. We're just like, oh, it's like poetic, but it's actually much deeper. What, what we see here is this, and then we'll move on very quickly. The reverse of the curse where now the earth and the cosmos is stepping up to protect the church and Israel. Do you, do you remember in, in the book of Romans chapter 7 and 8, Paul the apostle writes about how all of creation groans in eager ex expectation, right? Waiting for the revelation of who? For you and I. That's a mystery verse that all of creation is like, ah, like disjointed and held under the curse, waiting for you and I to reveal who we really are. That's like a, like what? What does that even mean? I don't know. We got to pray about that. But I suspect we have far more power than we, we tend to believe we have in Christ even over natural disasters, even over things like that. That's what I suspect. There's something about even the created order waiting for us. When you walk outside and it's like the trees are blossoming, beautiful time is spring, right? And, and you keep that scripture in mind, like, like all of creation is like looking at you, like, like when are you going to step up to the plate and let Christ shine through you? Now, the fullness of that won't happen until the day of resurrection, Amen. But there's something there, like even the clouds and the sun, they like, it's like all of creation is like, yo, waiting for you and I to live out the fullness of our identity. I don't know about you, that makes me like, Monique. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And he's the God of heaven and earth. You got it. And he used water, the serpent, to try to come in a different way mm. as a woman, to tackle in a different way. But God is God over even now. That's right. So he took that very thing. That's right. That the devil tried to use against the woman. That's right. Thinking like Joseph, what the devil, what the enemy meant no harm, God turned into good. Yes. But he turned the very earth that the devil is the Prince of, he opened it up to save the woman from the mm. because he 
is God. He is Lord. He is King. He is sovereign. He will lead you to be. Providence. 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 Oof. Are you feeling tight? Are you good? <laughs> can't get into chapter 13 because we only have like three minutes left. <laughs> let's, let's, just, let's just let the next two minutes or so, let, I just want to open it up. I just want to open it up right now. Let's turn, let's turn to the Lord in prayer right now and worship. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer and worship. We glorify you, God, and we worship you. We praise you, Father, and we give you thanks. You are altogether beautiful, lovely, the Rose of Sharon, the Ancient of Days. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Son. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We worship you, O God, and we give you thanks for this word for your presence, for your love. We thank you for cleansing, the cleansing flow of the cross. We thank you for the blood of the Lamb of God. We thank you for the word of our testimony and how you've delivered us, how you've set us free. Lord, we thank you for the testimonies around us, for our sisters and brothers here in this room. We thank you, Lord, we worship you, Lord. We give you thanks. May your power continue to be displayed. We thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Mm. Jesus. We join the angels in worshiping you, O oh God. We worship you, Lord. We give you the fruit of our lips, the praise of our hearts, O oh God. We thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord, no one is like unto you, O oh God. Who is like unto you, O oh God? We worship you, Lord. We worship you. Yes. Sit enthroned in the midst of our praise, O oh God. We worship you, Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you for your word, Lord. Yes, for your presence. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, 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 mm. yeah, yeah. Yes, Lord. Mm -hmm. Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Father, I ask that you would pour out your richest blessings on every single person here this evening. And you would continue to break uh, the chains and the yokes uh, around our necks and our minds, Lord. Set us free. That we may worship you with, with, with 
a spirit of freedom, Lord. That is your Holy Spirit. We ask that you continue to cover us this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, for the rest of this week, Lord. Just give us a zeal to, to seek you out and to do your will and to, to really operate out of that place of authority that you have given us. Remind us of who we are, Lord. We thank you for your word. Continue to give us a hunger for your word. Help us to love one another, Lord, to be gracious and merciful, to be kind and gentle in the name of Christ, Father, that we may image you, Lord, that we may look like you. We thank you, Father. We bless you. Yes. Yes, Lord. We thank you, Father. And everyone said, amen, amen. Yes, Lord. I love you guys. Get home safe. God bless you all. <laughs>